Welcome to the Marijuana Webinar Series Part 2, The Impact of Legalization on Youth. My name is Jason and I will be your operator. At this time, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Later we will conduct a question and answer session. Also, please note this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Jane Allen. Jane, you may begin. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here with us today for the second in RTI's Case Studies in Marijuana Policy webinar series. Our topic for today is the impact of marijuana legalization on youth. My name is Jane Allen, and I'm with RTI International. RTI International is the host of this webinar, and as you may know, RTI is an independent, nonprofit research institute with the mission to improve the human condition by turning knowledge into practice. In keeping with that mission, our primary goal for this webinar series is to connect states at different stages of marijuana policy development and implementation, so states that are early in this process can benefit from those with more experience. We have three wonderful speakers for you today. We'll open with a brief presentation by Matthew Farley, Chief Scientist and Head of RTI's Center for Health Policy Science and Tobacco Research. And Matthew will set the stage for our featured speakers by highlighting a few interesting findings from RTI's National Marijuana Survey. Then we'll go to Julia Dilley. Julia is a senior research scientist and epidemiologist with Oregon Health Authority and the Multnomah County Health Department. And Daniel Vigil is a physician specializing in preventive medicine and public health. Daniel manages the Marijuana Health Monitoring and Research Program at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge a team of RTI communication and marketing specialists who are here with us today and have already done so much to make this webinar possible. Cameron Johnson, Anelda Butler, Malia Dixon, and Shane Hamstra. There's a comment box, as you see, on the left-hand side of your screen. Please type any questions you may have for our speakers into the box, and we will hold questions until the end. So now, um, let's move on to Matthew Farley. And Matthew, if you're ready. I'm ready. Great. Go for it. Thanks, Jane. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, I am in a position to uh, start out with a little bit of a data appetizer um, before we get to the main courses here. Um, so in late 2016 and into 2017, RTI uh, fielded a, a large national survey uh, on marijuana policy and attitudes and beliefs. And we ended up with over 1,000 adults, 7,000 adults, and we recruited them through probability-based methods and address-based sample, as well as recruiting people through social media to increase our sample size. And, and um, not only is it a national sample, but we stratified our sampling so that we got um, nearly 3,000 adults from states with recreational marijuana, just over 2,000 from states with some form of medical marijuana, and close to 2,000 from all other states. So the data collection was done both through the mail as well as online. <clears throat> the measures that we have, it's a wide range of beliefs, risk perceptions, support for legalization. And we ask for support for both medical and recreational marijuana. We ask about intention to use um, and uh, co-use with other substances. Um, and where possible, we're able to compare across um, across those three groups of states. So given the topic of today, um, what I thought I'd do is just pull out a, a couple of measures that relate to youth. So one of the questions we asked was the perceived impact of legalizing medical and recreational marijuana on youth use. And what you see in the blue bars is um, their opinion toward recreational marijuana and the gray bars are for medical marijuana. So the question is asking um, whether what the percentage of people who agree or strongly agree that legalizing either recreational or, or medical marijuana will lead to more use among teenagers. And the first 
Um, you know, so what we did was we grouped it by those, those three groups of states. Um, and we split out. So the first two are recreational marijuana states. So it's 31 percent believe medical marijuana would lead to more teen use, and 51 percent believe recreational marijuana would lead to more teen use. And then we group medical marijuana. Some of those states have very liberal laws in terms of access, and others are more restrictive. So we broke those out into two separate groups. Um, and then finally, the last group, states with no uh, legal marijuana. But even though there appear to be some differences, there really are no statistically significant differences across these groups of states. And then looking at uh, another measure, this is the percent of adults that agree or strongly agree that it's okay for adults to either drink alcohol or smoke marijuana in front of teens. So nationwide, and regardless of the state marijuana law, it's more socially acceptable for adults to drink alcohol in front of teens than to smoke marijuana in front of them. And you can see the percentages are fairly low for smoking marijuana, and about 30, hovering around 30 percent for drinking alcohol. And again, there appear to be some minor differences, but there really are no statistically significant differences across those groups of states. So those are the, the, two, uh, the two little items that we wanted to get you warmed up with. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. There were some people with problems with the audio. Um, doesn't look like any questions have popped up. So Jane, are we then going to the poll? Um, yeah, that's a great idea. So here's our first poll, and just to let you all know, we have three poll questions that we'll um, ask throughout the course of our time together. It looks like you know what to do because um, you're doing it. So that's great. So this is a question actually from our National Marijuana Survey, some of the data that Matthew was just looking at. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree that legalization of recreational marijuana leads to more teens using marijuana. And I would say, based on the responses that you're entering now, that your data looks very much in line with um, the distribution we're seeing in our national study, actually. So very good. Thank you for participating in that poll. And now um, we'll move on to Julia. Are you ready, Julia? Yes, I think so. That's great. Okay. Go ahead. Let's see. Um, so thank you. I'm. Uh, this is Julia Dilley. I'm with the Oregon State Public Health Division, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of information today about our experience and what we've seen thus far in Oregon, uh, particular to youth and their response to uh, marijuana or cannabis regulation. I use those terms sort of um, interchangeably. Um, so specifically, we'll talk about youth, cannabis use, knowledge, and attitudes. Um, I'm going to share some information about risk factors we're seeing, including advertising and messaging exposure, and then a little bit about uh, health outcomes among youth and criminal justice outcomes. So there's a lot more data in some of our Oregon summary reports. Um, unfortunately, we've had a couple of reports come out so far. Unfortunately, they all seem to have the same cover, so you have to watch the date you're looking for. Um, my preferred way of accessing them is to Google them and then pick the right one. Uh, the most current one is currently from December 2016, but there's a new report that will be released in early 2018, so within the next month. So first, um, I'll share a little bit about what happened in Oregon as part of marijuana or cannabis legalization. So um, as you may know, Oregon was one of the first four states to legalize. Washington and Colorado were first in 2012, and we came two years later alongside Alaska in 2014. And of course, more states have come since. And when I use the term legalize, I'm talking about both decriminalization and specifically opening a regulated market for sale of non-medical cannabis. So even though we're a legalized state in Oregon, um, it's still illegal for people under age 21 to use and possess uh, marijuana or cannabis, and it's still Ill illegal to uh, drive under the, uh, under the influence of marijuana. So um, Oregon and Washington are right next to each other, so I often like to put Oregon's legalization 
activities in the context of Washington. Um, Washington is a bigger state than Oregon. They have about 7 million people and we have about 4 million. Um, but some of the border stuff that happens along uh, from Washington tends to leak over into Oregon. So these two states were both legal or, or early adopters of medical legalization in 1998. And then, as I mentioned, Washington passed their legalization initiative in 2012. Markets opened in 2014. Um, and then Oregon, we passed our initiative in 2014 and then rather quickly uh, opened recreational sales in fall of 2015. This is a map of the currently licensed uh, cannabis retailers, non-medical or recreational retailers in Oregon as of November 2017. We had 505 at that time. You'll notice most of them are concentrated on the left or uh, western side of the state. That's relatively um, consistent with the population distribution. Um, also, that uh, the left side of the state tends to be a bit more left-leaning politically as well. So how has youth marijuana use changed since legalization in Oregon? Um, I'll tell you about that using two, our two school-based youth surveys from Oregon. Um, we're very lucky that we have two surveys that have been well-established. Um, currently, they're going every other year. So we have one survey that happens in spring of even-numbered years and one survey that happens in the spring of odd-numbered years. Um, they are both conducted among 8th and 11th graders. Um, they're both led by state agencies. They have uh, a number of identical questions, including past 30-day cannabis use, uh, but some questions are only on one survey or the other. So uh, as I'm sharing information with you, sometimes it's from one survey and sometimes another, but both of these are sort of pre-post legalization um, uh, contrast. So first, here's our um, the prevalence of current marijuana use, so any use in the past 30 days among Oregon's 11th graders and 8th graders compared to monitoring the future 11th graders and 8th graders. And um, I guess a couple things to note. One is that Oregon has trended above the nation um, for quite a long time. But the other thing to notice is that we didn't see dramatic increases or really any, any increases to speak of um, after the legalization initiative passed in fall of 2014, and Measure 90, and then also not after sales began in the fall of 2015. Here I'm showing you the breakdown by grade and gender. Um, you'll notice uh, so this is one of our surveys, the student wellness from the spring of even-numbered years. Um, we saw non-significant declines among females and males in eighth grade and then males in 11th grade, but we did see a non-significant but concerning increase among females in 11th grade. And then this is the most recent, this, these are very <laughs> uh, fresh data from the Oregon Healthy Teens from this spring. We saw the same exact pattern um, of declines among both genders in eighth grade, but then again, that concerning increase among females in the 11th grade. Um, as you may be seeing in your own states currently, in terms of current or past 30 day substance use, marijuana is uh, more popular among young people than cigarettes, but not yet as popular as alcohol. Again, putting, this in, putting cannabis use into context with um, other types of, of substances, um, for eighth graders, you just saw the declines among both genders for cannabis use among eighth graders. Here you see that that's consistent with also declines overall in cigarette smoking and alcohol use um, within eighth grade. And in 11th grade, that, um, that overall increase you see for marijuana use, again, that was being driven by the young women. Um, that's in the context of, at the same time, stable or declining uh, rates of cigarette smoking and alcohol use. We're also very concerned about not only are any kids using at all in the past 30 days, but how often are they using? We've been pretty concerned that maybe kids who use uh, might use more frequently. Um, our data currently don't give us evidence to support concerns about that. In fact, we're seeing increases in less frequent use among kids who use. Um, so here you see both eighth grade and 11th grade. Um, the greatest share of kids in eighth grade particularly are using only one to two days a month. Um, and then uh, we see relatively stable rates of sort of modest use and then declining rates of uh, using on 10 or more days. I do want to point out, though, that 10 or more days a month um, is a pretty big window. So that I, I really wish we had more precise information about youth that are using on 20 or more days a month or, um, or daily. Um, in terms of how youth are using cannabis, um, this is from our 2017 survey uh, among both grades. And in both grades, both uh, in both grades, 
most youth who use cannabis are smoking it. Um, but a good share of them are also using edibles, so about one in four. Um, also, a good number of them, maybe one in five, are using dabs, which is of great concern. And then you can see here that because youth in this question are able to give multiple, you know, they're able to give multiple answers. So if they smoked it, they marked that. They used edibles, they marked that. So multiple select. And you can see that um, more than one third of kids who use cannabis are using it in multiple ways. So, um, so overall, we haven't seen a, a ton of shifts in cannabis use patterns among youth that are that are alarming, but we also want to be careful and look sort of upstream a little bit in some of the risk factor indicators um, to anticipate what might be coming in the future in case the impacts of legalization take more time to, to um, influence youth and their behaviors. So in terms of risk factors, um, I'll say a little bit about perceptions of harm and access um, and peer norms and parent, parent perception perceptions of parent um, attitudes, and then media messaging. And the spoiler alert here is that although we haven't seen tremendous increase, increases or um, alarming changes in youth use yet, um, most of our risk factor indicators are going in the not, not good direction from a prevention lens. So here is Oregon 11th graders who think uh, using select substances is harmful. These questions are a little funny sometimes because contrasting using marijuana one or two times a week to smoking a pack or more of cigarettes a day. Um, smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, that, you know, every bit of evidence we have is that that is a dangerous thing to do. Um, the evidence is not completely clear about what the health effects are of smoking marijuana one to two times a week. So some of these variations might actually be uh, correct knowledge. But I do want to point out to you that, um, that the perception of risk or harm from young people for smoking marijuana is less than for um, cigarette smoking, for binge drinking, or uh, daily alcohol drinking, and then also for prescription drug use. And perceived harm has been declining among youth for cannabis. So perceived harm from cannabis use is declining, not to a great extent, but it is statistically significant decline. Um, and at the same time that these other indicators seem to be holding kind of steady, or maybe even increasing perceived harm for al alcohol use among youth. So that's a concern. Um, maybe more worrisome is how easy substances are to get. Um, young people are telling us that they think marijuana is more difficult to get than cigarettes if they want some. Um, it looks like it's almost similar to the, to the degree of difficulty they perceive in getting alcohol. And um, here you see that more 11th graders over time think it's easy to get marijuana um, in the context of declining perceived availability of cigarettes and alcohol at the same time. Uh, and this is uh, the same question, but just our more recent information from the Oregon Healthy Teen Survey. Again, you know, we see it slightly trending upward for marijuana in contrast to slightly declining downward for um, e-cigarettes and uh, beer, wine, or hard liquor. So slightly fewer kids over time think that their friends would disapprove if they used marijuana. Not, not large changes, but significant, statistically significant ones. Same for parents, um, modest statistically significant declines in youth who think their parents would disapprove if they used marijuana. Of course, now it's legal for parents to use as adults, so that um, is something to be aware of. If, if more adults are using in their home, Matthew just presented that may, many people still disapprove of using in front of children, but if young people are aware of their parents using, that could be playing in here. We don't know. Um, here we see that, that parental perceived parental disapproval declining. Um, for marijuana, it's in the context of kids still perceiving pretty even disapproval by their parents for smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, using prescription drugs. Um, I find it interesting that, that fewer kids think their parents would disapprove of using marijuana than smoking cigarettes. And then last, I want to talk a little about the uh, media advertising. So, with the opening of a retail market, it's certainly legal to, or at least in Oregon, it's, it's legal to advertise for those cannabis retailers. And of course, they're looking to um, attract people to their markets. So um, in the absence of information at the time to assess exposure to marijuana advertising among youth, we asked it on some um, adult surveys that we were fielding. And then fall of 2017, about two thirds of Oregon adults said that they had seen or heard marijuana advertising in their community in the past year, which was about twice as many who said they'd heard uh, marijuana health risk messages in the past 
in the past month. If I said past year, I meant past month for both of these. We wanted to show you some of the examples of what that cannabis advertising looks like. Um, advertising is not supposed to appeal to kids or to include images that are attractive to young people, but it's, these are real examples of um, street side marketing, and you can see that it, it's possible that some of these things could be arguably um, sort of kid friendly. Also, some of these um, messages to promote cannabis purchases are they're just extremely visible. So this is a, an, a billboard that's along the I-5 corridor outside of Portland um, in early 2017. It's huge. You see it right as you go over the bridge. Um, it's a very populated area. So that's a pretty strong message that maybe young people are seeing if they're uh, on the roads. Um, we have billboards advertising dab use. And then one thing that I guess I hadn't anticipated so much, but um, this is a billboard that's not advertising a cannabis store, but it is advertising a hydroponic store. In Oregon, you can grow four cannabis plants legally <clears throat> for recreational use. This billboard is advertising hydroponic products so that you can grow your four cannabis plants, but they've got this <laughs> very cute uh, uh, My Little Pony type um, mark, uh, imager imagery on there, so I can't help but think that young people wouldn't be attracted to that. In contrast, the Oregon Public Health Division has put together a very thoughtful um, youth prevention campaign. Um, it's a lot, I don't see it very much, but I'm not in the target demographic. Um, but they did a very nice job of trying to find um, themes that would resonate with young people, um, primarily not being, using scare tactics, but sort of uh, encouraging young people to just make a smart choice now uh, by not using cannabis. So we've been talking about youth and then risk factors for use among young people. So for those young people who are using, um, have we seen adverse health effects? Uh, these are annual counts of marijuana-related calls to the Oregon Poison Center. From 2014, again, uh, remember that uh, we voted to legalize in the fall of 2014. So 2015 shows you the impact of the early, of decriminalization and then early opening of the retail market. And then in 2016, um, recreational sales were in place all year. So you can see that um, the greatest increase in numbers of calls came from the 21 and older crowd. Um, young people, people under 21, um, it's, we do see a small increase, but the numbers are pretty small. And then this chart is um, the rates of marijuana-related emergency department visits from October 2015, which is when um, retail sales first started, to November 2017, so about a um, two-year period, and these are rates, so contrasting the rates of emergency department visits, we see the greatest rates among the 18 to 25-year-old uh, group, particularly among males. Um, I showed the numbers of cases that are represented underneath the chart so that you can see that although the rate is highest among those that young adult group, uh, because the population is smaller relative to the 26 and older group, uh, the numbers of cases that are represented in the rates are smaller. So last, um, we wanted to share about what's happening with criminal justice encounters for marijuana offenses among young people. In Oregon, we use the term youth referrals rather than arrests for uh, juvenile criminal justice incidents. Um, the state has tried really hard to not engage young people in the criminal justice system um, by, by arresting them and then um, including them, trying to avoid uh, putting them in that uh, that prison pipeline. So they're pretty careful about that, um, including that possession of less than an ounce of marijuana is not a criminal offense for people under 18. So the data I'm showing you here are for uh, young people under 18 who have been referred for possession, but they're not, um, they're not being arrested. What we have seen is since the opening of the retail market um, it, in 2015, we are seeing an increase in the number of referrals for cannabis possession for young people, particularly the older end of the young of the young people groups, the 16 and 17 year olds and 13 to 15 year olds. So we're pretty concerned about watching that and making sure that, um, yeah, just that we monitor whether this is having an adverse consequence of, of engaging youth more um, with criminal, uh, criminal justice risk factors, um, like referral to the criminal justice system. And that is the end. 
And I think we're jumping to the poll. Yeah, Julia, thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting to hear what you're observing in Oregon, and I appreciate you sharing your data and your insights with us. Um, yep, so here's our next poll related to Julia's talk. In your opinion, which behavior is most risky for a young person? Using marijuana, using alcohol, smoking, cigarettes, texting while driving is a hot one right now, and having unprotected sex. Looks like this crowd is going with texting while driving. Uh, so that's interesting to think about. Um, all right, I know that some of you have sent in some questions for Julia, but we are going to hold those till the end. Um, so I think at this time I would like to move on and hear from Daniel and um, take a look at his data from Colorado. Are you ready, Daniel? Yes, thank you, Jane. Great. All right. So. Um, I'm Daniel Vijo. I'm with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment's uh, Marijuana Health Monitoring and Research Program. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just briefly introduce our program's main tasks, um, talk about accidental marijuana exposure, youth marijuana use, um, healthcare encounters, some disciplinary data, and then kind of wrap it up. Um, I, I think I may have accidentally gotten all of Oregon's data because our numbers are nearly identical. Uh, so our program's uh, primary responsibilities are conducting um, literature reviews on the research for health effects of marijuana. Um, we produce a report that I'll uh, show you on the next slide. Uh, we also monitor data. Uh, we do all the analysis for patterns of use for youth and adults and uh, pregnant women. And then we also monitor health impacts via um, poison center calls, emergency department visits, and hospitalizations. Um, <clears throat> the third thing is that we have been able to get funding to um, provide grants for research, both in medical efficacy and in public health concerns. So this is our report monitoring health concerns related to marijuana in Colorado. Um, ours also comes out every two years and uh, on the alternate years to Oregon's, which is kind of handy. Um, it's, it's called 2016, but it came out in January of 2017. It was our second edition. Uh, there'll be another one uh, in January of 2019. Um, there's a link on this slide, or you can simply search monitoring marijuana Colorado. So for accidental marijuana ingestion uh, among children, first, uh, unsafe storage is a concern. And uh, we have some information on that from the Child Health Survey. In 2016, a uh, little over 8% of homes in Colorado with children aged 1 to 14 uh, had marijuana in or around the home. And then on the question about how it was stored, uh, uh, some safe storage method was not indicated by one in five uh, of those homes. Overall, that's almost 2% of, of all the homes with children have uh, potential exposure to unsafely stored marijuana. Then on our um, poison center data, um, exposure calls originating in Colorado uh, for zero to eight-year-olds increased from eight in 2009 to 40 in 2016 in Colorado. And um, from Colorado Hospital Association data, uh, I am giving information in this presentation about hospitalizations. The emergency department data is very similar. So among, um, among those hospitalizations for zero to eight year olds, uh, it's quite rare that, that the, this age group has a marijuana code. Um, but it did increase from 0.002% uh, to 0.019% uh, from pre-medical marijuana commercialization to uh, post-retail legalization. Um, quick clarification on that. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the 
this whole memorandum that um, basically gave more leeway to uh, states' laws around marijuana, and in um, that came out in 2009, and and that went in Colorado. That was when uh, dispen medical dispensaries were able to open, and we saw a huge jump in the number of uh, medical marijuana card holders, and also began to see uh, some of the shifts in, in data like uh, poison center and hospital data. So going on to adolescent marijuana use, again, uh, nearly identical to, to Oregon's. Um, our largest survey is the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, and uh, it's over 15,000 um, students each time it's conducted. Uh, two challenges with these surveys are, are just survey burden in the schools. Uh, it's hard for them to, to conduct them. And then uh, funding as well. So um, the ways that we address that are we've uh, gathered questions from really all of the interested parties to uh, create a single health-related survey for high school students. And then we only conduct it every two years. But we aim for, for this much larger um, sample size than, than many population surveys get. So this dark green bar is marijuana use. And it has fluctuated some, but has been pretty stable for over a decade. Um, in 2015, at 21% of high school students reported using marijuana in the past 30 days. Uh, for alcohol, it's around 30%, and tobacco, 8.6. Both of those substances have been on the decline. We also look at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, they have a much smaller sample size. As you can see, the uh, margins of error or confidence intervals are, are quite wide on the red bar, which is Colorado data, for ages 12 to 17. And uh, there appeared to be a, a slow, gradual increase. Um, those estimates came down in the 2014-15 and not on this graph, but we just very recently got numbers for 2015-16, which uh, the estimate was even lower. We're not right now saying that that means that the use declined after legalization, um, because we still have our bigger Healthy Kids Colorado survey. We're very interested in seeing what the 2017 numbers look like, uh, which we should have by this summer. A few other aspects of high school marijuana use in Colorado. Um, we look at frequency of use, um, broken down by one or two times in the past month, 3 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 39, and, and over 40 times a month. Most interested, of course, in the, in the 20 and above, which we consider daily or near daily use. Um, and each of those groups has not really changed in prevalence over time. Excuse me, uh, I had to drink a little water. Uh, so not surprisingly, we see that use increases with grade level uh, from 2.2% in sixth grade to almost 28% uh, in 12th grade. Again, that's past 30-day use. Uh, use prevalence in high school is nearly identical between males and females, uh, which is different from adults, where you see um, in Colorado about 16% of males and 10% of females. Uh, and then Asian students are the one uh, racial group that is really different from the rest. They're less likely to use than blacks, whites, or Hispanics. Those other three groups have no statistical difference. Um, on the more extreme end of, of use, um, marijuana addiction treatment admissions, um, the, the green bar here is the 17 and younger age group from 2009 to 2015. And um, we've seen an increase in uh, admissions where marijuana is the, the primary drug of abuse. Uh, simultaneously, we've seen some decrease in um, older ages. Uh, and that red bar is the 18 to 24 years old. They have 
the highest use rates and the highest um, marijuana addiction treatment admissions rates. Okay, some data about um, healthcare encounters. Uh, so for the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center, um, marijuana exposure calls for the, this 9 to 17 year old age group increased from 16 in 2009 to 42 in 2016. Um, we're not sure what the, the cause of these increases are, um, poison center or hospital data. Uh, certainly some of it could be due to um, increased adverse events. Um, do we, you know, because we don't see an increase in um, in use on the surveys, it's you know it's possible that uh, more kids are trying. Uh, we actually had a um, poison center call reported to us recently uh, from uh, a 15 year old who went to a restaurant and and got was started feeling sick and um, went to the emergency department. Um, and tested positive for marijuana and later admitted that he had tried an edible with some friends earlier in the day. Uh, you know, it's possible that, that maybe more kids are trying and, um, and perhaps only trying once and so aren't really showing up as an increased use, or sorry, increased use. Um, it's also possible that um, kids or even parents are, are more likely to admit exposure and reach out for, for health care help. Um, <clears throat> Colorado Hospital Association data shows that in this 9 to 17 year old age group, uh, the percentage of hospitalizations for that age group that had a marijuana code increased from 4.3% in 2001 to 9 uh, to 7.3% in 1415. Some of those same possibilities I mentioned are uh, they apply here in addition to the fact that um, this data was the ICD-9 coding. Um, the reason I mention that is because there's been a switch. And, um, and in that coding, one of the codes is non-dependent cannabis abuse. So if a healthcare provider asks someone whether they use marijuana and they say yes, uh, they can get that code even if the uh, marijuana use was not related to the cause for them, them coming in. Um, so that's an unfortunate aspect of, of that data. In late 2015, the ICD coding changed to an updated system. There are much more detail in the marijuana codes, and so from 2016 on, we should be better able to clarify um, some of the reasons for um, people with marijuana who have uh, a needy visit or hospitalization. Uh, so, a little bit of disciplinary data. Ah, um, I, I'm going to go ahead and address one question that came up here. Uh, was there an increase in use among older youth, grades 11 and 12? Uh, we did see a statistical increase in 11th grade youth from 2013 to 2015. Um, and 11th and 12th grade use, of course, is the um, the higher prevalence of use among high school students. It's similar to the level of use in the 18 to 25 year age group. And uh, so it's definitely a concern. And again, we're, we're really looking forward to 20, 2017 data to help clarify that. Uh, okay, so on to this disciplinary data. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is public school data from Colorado Department of Education, and um, it starts at 2004 and 5 school year on the far left up to 2016-17 on the far right. Um, so due to some changes in policy, the total suspension rate over that time uh, has decreased. However, beginning in uh, 2009 and 10 school year, uh, there was an increase in drug suspension and um, the majority of those drug suspensions are uh, for marijuana. 
uh, in 2016-17, it was 74% of the drug suspensions were marijuana. This is expulsion rates. Um, oh, and let me back up and, and give you numbers, because the, the numbers here are very small. Uh, and also, uh, clarification, that there are different scales. So the total suspension rate is a scale on the right-hand side, where in 2016-17, it's just below 10,000 per 100,000. So um, you know, one in one tenth of uh, students um, had a suspension, although that could be some students multiple times. Uh, the drug suspension rate has the scale on the left-hand side, and in 2016-17, that was around 470 per 100,000. So still a small portion of suspensions. Um, this is expulsions. These are both on the same scale. The purple bar on the top is total expulsion rate. Uh, also because of policy changes has uh, gone down substantially. Uh, the drug expulsion rate saw that similar increase in 2009 and 10, uh, but then has also come down um, because of some of those same uh, policy changes. So um, you know th that does make it a little bit difficult to, to really interpret the um, behaviors in schools around marijuana. Uh, these expulsions for drugs, uh, it's still the majority of those are um, marijuana at 68 percent, and the rate is um, around 40 per 100,000 for drug expulsion. Uh, from schools, law enforcement referrals, these are for a variety of different types of violations. Um, the, the largest is a catch-all of other code of conduct violations, but that second bar um, at 851 is marijuana violations in the 2016-17 school year. Uh, and these are not rates, they're, they're total numbers um, for all of the um, Colorado public schools. Uh, finally, arrest rates. This is broken down by age groups with 10 to 17 on the left, 18 to 20 in the middle, and then uh, 21 and older on the right-hand side. So not surprisingly, arrests went way down in the 21 and older age group. Um, marijuana is still illegal unless someone has a medical card for both of the other age groups. And so in that 10 to 17 age group, um, we see a small decrease, um, likely related to just a shift in uh, law enforcement practice to um, not be on the lookout for uh, possession violations. So uh, in summary, uh, we have not seen an increase in adolescent past 30-day marijuana use uh, or in frequency abuse. Uh, but adolescent addiction treatment has increased. Um, not completely sure what explains that. It's possible that, that use has shifted in a way that we aren't picking up on these surveys. Uh, we are trying to conduct surveys to get at more detail about the amount of uh, marijuana that individuals are using, um, although we haven't uh, conducted that for youth yet. We just finished one for adults, but working toward better information. Um, poison center calls and hospitalizations have increased for both young children and adolescents. Uh, school suspensions for drugs have increased, and most of those drug suspensions are for marijuana. Uh, this slide reads a little bit off because it's not most of school suspensions, it's just most of the drug suspensions. Um, marijuana arrests have decreased across the board. Um, a portion of the increases seen may be due to changes in the amounts or the ways that marijuana is used, uh, and a portion may be due to a greater willingness to admit use or more open use. Um, and increased awareness. And by open use, I, I didn't mention uh, earlier on the suspension slide, um, but you know, anecdotally, we hear that 
um, students may just be more bold about using at school and, and are often saying, well, it's legal now. It's not even having an idea that um, it's not legal for them, and it's certainly not legal at school. Um, so uh, there may be some changes like that that, that result in uh, some of the numbers that we see. Uh, so then um, it, you know, our 2017 data should really help to clarify some of these trends and, and um, give us some more information on the concerning areas. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Daniel. I, I really liked your summary because it helps me to at least start to get a grip on why, if we're not seeing increased use prevalence, why we might be seeing changes in some of these other um, measures and behaviors. So um, thank you so much for that. And um, let's go now to our last poll. And this one um, is, looks like the title's a little cut off, but um, the question is, in your opinion, which factors, um, which, which factor would be most effective in preventing youth marijuana use in states that legalize? So take a minute to let us know what you think and look at what your peers are thinking about this issue. And it looks like um, public education campaigns and substance use education programs are the big ones for you all. So, um, well, thank you so much. We have some questions coming in now for both speakers. And um, let's move on to, let's move on to some questions. So, Julia, the first question for you is sort of a clarifying question. Um, can you talk about who's re the responsible entity for survey administration uh, in Oregon? So is it a public health only initiative or did, um, did you partner with the State Department of Education? Mm -hmm. So both, uh, the two alternating surveys, so again, one in even spring of even years and one in spring of odd years, um, those are both fielded by the Oregon Health Authority uh, in cooperation with the Department, State Department of Education. Um, one of the surveys is more like the YRBS, the Oregon Healthy Teen Survey is more like the YRBS. So that includes some questions like bike helmets and um, new, how many vegetables you're eating, that sort of thing. And then the other survey, the Student Wellness Survey, is a little bit more like the Communities That Care Survey, a bit more focused on um, uh, risk and preventive, risk and protective factors. So, so they're both they're both fielded by state agencies. Um, with great cooperation to try to limit the burden on Oregon schools. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Daniel, um, you mentioned in your talk a lack of resources for surveys. So um, one of our listeners was curious um, why the state doesn't dedicate more resource, resources to surveillance from the um, significant tax revenue. Yeah, uh, well, I think we actually have pretty pretty decent funding for for surveys. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we we get a very large sample size. Um, there is a, a bit of a political um, disagreement around uh, these high school, well, and and um, middle school surveys, uh, which results in some school districts opting out of the survey completely, um, which has been one criticism. And you know we're continually working to, to get buy-in, um, but also results in uh, you know not having the full support of of legislature for for funding the surveys. That said, though, um, I, I think we do have have decent funding and um, and data collection. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so questions came in for both of you, actually, related to um, the engagement with the criminal justice system and specifically the questions and, and the disciplinary system. And so specifically the questions relate to race, ethnicity, and whether um, you track data by race, ethnicity, and if so, um, if you're able to figure out what's happening there. So. Um, I, I guess 
um, to Julia and then maybe to Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of, or I didn't talk at all about um, race and ethnicity results for Oregon. Um, Oregon is not an incredibly diverse state. Uh, so I think the, I think for youth, it's something like 70% uh, white race among youth. Um, so for cannabis use by race and ethnicity, we haven't had enough power to detect significant differences, with the exception, just like Daniel in Colorado shared, um, that Asian students seem to be less likely to report current cannabis use than other um, than kids of other uh, races and ethnicities. So, so for youth, I, I just don't think we have enough information yet to know. Um, for criminal justice, we are we are looking at trends in that for youth, but I um, kind of hesitate to comment on it because I'm not. The way that race and ethnicity is measured in the data for youth referrals um, makes me concerned that I'm not I'm not totally sure what we're looking at. So uh, mm -hmm. I kind of hesitate to comment on it, ex except to say that as, as far as we have looked at it, we're not seeing dramatic differences, again, with the exception that Asian youth appear to be less likely to be um, referred for, uh, for breaking the law around cannabis possession. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your... I understand and appreciate your, um, you know, caution in speaking about um, those data. Daniel, do you have anything to add or anything different that you're seeing there? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I don't have numbers for the different age groups, but overall, uh, we do see a disproportionate um, rate of arrests among blacks than white, um, and and that. Uh, as I mentioned, well, so I mentioned for youth, there's not a uh, statistical difference in, in use rate. Um, among adults, there's also not a, a statistical difference. So um, seeing that difference in arrest rates, you know, um, suggests that there's some um, sort of a disparity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I, I imagine that's why people are asking, because I know that this is a, you know, disparities in arrest rates, um, incarceration rates are a public health issue that a lot of people are concerned about and looking yeah. at. So um, thank you for your insight there. Um, it'll be interesting to track over time and to also think about what can be done um, about that. So. Um, I wanted to ask you, oh, um, Julia, uh, you, you ha there were a couple other questions about, um, I guess this one's a little bit of a technical question about your presentation, and I'm not sure now if you'll, uh, so a listener is asking why the study was done in on grades 8 and 11, and did you look at other high school grades, or is that the artifact of the survey data? Mm -hmm. That's an artifact of the survey data. Our two school-based surveys are uh, are conducted among 8th and 11th graders as um, representative of middle school and high school, tr again, trying to limit the burden of uh, surveys on schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And also, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between perceived harm and behavior? Sure. I mean, I think there's a long um, history of, of uh, research that we think that uh, that greater perceived harm from a substance would be is associated with less use of a substance and conversely declining um, perceptions of harm would would lead to more inclinations to use or fewer fewer concerns or barriers about using um, I will say nationally perceived harm from cannabis has been declining um, including specifically among young people for quite a while and I know I've heard, I've been part of several research presentations where people are saying maybe this doesn't work the same way as it used to. Um, mm -hmm. But I think based, if, we, if you just looked at perceived harm and declining perceived harm, you would think that you would start to see increased use. And um, we haven't seen it yet. Interesting, yeah. And I, I know that we've talked about this, Julia, but we have traditionally seen that in surveys, like, for example, in Monitoring the Future, that um, changes in perceived harm um, are followed approximately you know, a year or so later by changes in behavior, historically. Um, so it's interesting that that is not, it seems like that may not be happening now. Um, so uh, 
Tess asks, what are important regulations that states could consider to reduce youth risk? And I don't know um, if that question was specific to one or the other of your talks. So I think um, if either of you have thoughts on it, I'd love to hear them. I apologize. I missed your question because I was, was reading some other questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, um, what, what regulations could states put in place that would reduce, reduce youth risk? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, so my opinion, education, funding for education would be number one. I'll come back to that. Um, because I'll quickly say also, um, you know, advertising, I, I don't know whether uh, it makes a difference or not, but, um, you know, it would, it would make sense if it does. And um, fortunately in Colorado, we have, we're a little bit different from Oregon. Uh, no outdoor advertising is allowed except for the sign on the property of, um, of dispensaries. Um, and then there's there's a limit that any venue that is advertised in, whether it's print, media, um, or TV, internet, um, has to be a venue with less than 30 uh, percent children, um, and a couple of other things. But um, I think that's important as far as education. Um, it has to be funded uh, as early as possible. Um, I think education should come out uh, even before legalization. You know, if there's something on the ballot, if people are having the discussion, um, it'd be a good time to fund some some education, and it needs to start um, in middle school and before. Um, we see 40 percent of high school seniors who have tried marijuana first did that by age 14, um, and uh, yeah. So <laughs> that's my opinion. Well, um, a, a follow-up question from someone else comes in, um, and it's related. And um, Scott is asking whether you've seen an increase in education for K through 12. Um, oh, K through 12 school staff and parents. Um, so that looks like he's asking about staff parent training and whether you know anything about increases in that kind of training. This is Julia. I'll speak for Oregon. I don't think we know. In fact, we're right now um, hoping to find some resources to study and to get a sense of how schools are reacting to, um, in terms of you know how they're training, the messages they're sending to staff and to parents. Um, when when we are looking at a legal product now for you know where where parents and families could be using, um, but you of course shouldn't have it on school property. Um, but maybe maybe schools are we're just not sure what's going on. So we are trying to figure that out. Okay, great. Um, yeah, in Colorado, uh, as far as schools, that's uh, a lot of that is is kind of locally directed at the state level. Uh, we're in the process of putting together a, a resource bank of, uh, you know, it's supposed to be uh, educational resources that have some proven effectiveness. Um, that's between uh, department, that's primarily Department of Education, but, but our uh, health department has some involvement in that. Um, most of the education that has been done so far has been uh, through our health department, um, our preventive services division. Um, with the Protect What's Next campaign, uh, which I think is a great campaign. Um, you can Google it just with Protect What's Next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, going back to the issue of um, the, um, youth possession of marijuana and um, the criminal justice system and the um, detention system, for youth referrals, Viviana asks, are those who, um, is there a punishment for those who are in possession of marijuana? So if there's not a criminal charge, is there something? Do they have, um, are they sent to an education program? Are their parents notified? Or can you talk about 
what that looks like for youth? You know, I um, that is a great question. I that is more under local control, and I think that those sort of non-punitive and more supportive consequences are the kinds of things that happen after that. Mm -hmm. But um, I probably have to. I, I'd hesitate to generalize uh, mm -hmm. statewide, but I do think they attempt to be more more supportive and uh, okay. not so punitive. Great. Yeah. Um, agreed. It, it is it is illegal, so it, it's possible to to charge for possession uh, for minors. Mm -hmm. But you feel like there's like a cultural shift away from doing so when there's an appropriate alternative. It seems that way. Okay. Great. Um, and so I just want to ask you both, um, Julia and Daniel whether there's anything in these data that surprised you. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're not surprised now because you've been watching them slowly evolve over the last couple of years, but if you could, you know, go back in time and ask yourself um, what your expectations were for um, January 2018 after legalizing, like, is this where you thought you'd be or are there things about your uh, state experience that you find somewhat unexpected? I, a few years ago, I think I would have answered the, the question about will legalization increase youth use um, mm -hmm. as likely. Uh, so that has been um, something that I, I personally was very pleased to see in, in our data so far that there, mm -hmm. there wasn't an increase. Great. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, I really expected to see more increases in use among youth, um, but I will say I am I'm just concerned that our measures that we have available now aren't sensitive enough to maybe capture the changes in patterns of use and sort of the overall dose that young people are receiving. Um, I am worried that our surveillance systems mm -hmm. don't give us a good way to measure that. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So is that something um, that you can refine over time those measures? As I mentioned, we're working on it. Um, we conducted a, an adult survey among users uh, that tries to get at um, both uh, a lot more detail about how much mm -hmm. they're using and, um, and also some, some related things like why they're using and if they've experienced adverse effects. And, um, it's challenging in that, in that a lot of people don't know the sort of quantities or, or uh, potency of what they're using, or, or it's difficult to, to get them to answer questions in a way that uh, helps you come up with a cumulative dose, if you will. Right. Um, so, so still kind of trying to figure that out um, before expanding the use of those questions. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Well, um, thank you both for being here with us today to talk about the impact of legalization on youth. Um, I really appreciated your time and your insights. And um, for all of you who have joined us, thank you for coming. We will um, send out the, a copy of the slides, a PDF, I believe, um, so that you can access them um, and I'll just say I have a, a brief evaluation. If you have questions, feel free to contact me. My information is here. And we have a brief evaluation that we'll ask you to take just so that um, as we continue um, with this webinar series, we're responsive to your feedback and um, we can make improvements. So thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, one quick thing, Jane. This is Daniel. Uh, I mm -hmm. I forgot to put my uh, name and email address. If you wouldn't mind adding that to the the slides, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Yeah, sure. We will do. We'll add Daniel's contact information as well before we circulate the PDF. So you all will have access to that. Great point. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.